Welcome to the Rock Life Podcast. We are here once again for another episode here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. This is a ministry where in these podcasts, in these videos, as you're listening, we want to dive in and we're doing a sermon rewind of the messages that we have just had. This is a supplemental uh, video content for you that we believe, we feel very strongly about is going to help enhance not just the message, uh, but how God might speak to you through the message. So we always encourage you Check out the podcast of the weekend messages. Uh, but again, like, share, comment. We love engaging. We love hearing uh, from you all at church service uh, at, at lunch uh, about we run into you in the city about how um, the podcast has been uh, helpful for you, a tool for you. So we love you. Again, my name is Antonio. I'm here uh, with our friends and pastors, and we have a debate to settle, actually, uh, <laughs> because I would like to introduce one. Uh, as a pastor of disaster, but they have both claimed <laughs> to be pastors of disaster. Uh, to my left, uh, if you're not watching, you're listening, Pastor Joel, uh, who is our restoration and discipleship pastor, has been dubbed pastor of disaster. And Pastor Paul, who this last weekend uh, dubbed himself pastor of disaster. But in the conversation, there was a clarification yes. that Pastor Paul is the pastor of natural disasters. <laughs> <laughs> and the inside joke there is he has been ministering twice during earthquakes. Yes. <laughs> and a power outage recently. Correct. Too. So, I mean, be careful. The Holy yeah. Spirit comes when pastor uh, or I don't know, is the Lord smiting. I yeah, don't yeah. Know. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> yes. And then I have Pastor Joel here. So what's up? Your, your first time on the podcast. First time. Very first time. Yeah. yeah. It won't be your last. Well, we'll have you back. Thank you uh, for and and me. apparently, I'm not the cool one. When the views go up, when <laughs> uh, I am not here, so sorry, guys. Well, let's let's continue that thought. I'm the pastor of people disasters. Oh, people disasters. And Pastor Antonio is the pastor oh. of personal disasters. <laughs> oh my gosh! And we won't go there. We we don't have enough time on this podcast. The Lord has redeemed and yeah. restored, yes. uh, and so we are so good uh, and so glad to be here. Um, the date is, well, it doesn't matter the date. We are coming on the heels of week two of the Romans yeah. uh, sermon. Pastor Paul, man, shout out to Pastor Paul. Paul brought an amazing word this last weekend as you brought us through a few more verses. Again, if you're just tuning in, we just started a new book of the Bible where we go line upon line, precept upon precept, contextual thought. Oh, on contextual thought. And I love how you opened up the verses here and brought us to a new thought. Uh, Pastor Joel, I know you were listening att attunedly uh, and have some questions and thoughts. Uh, again, what we want to do in our time today is pull out as much as we can. Obviously, we're not just recapping the message because we want you to go hear the message uh, or you could hear it for yourself. But we want to find out what more we can squeeze and ooze out of there. One way that I like to ask or one question I like to ask is what maybe after you got off the stage for the last time, you're like, oh, man, I should have said this or I forgot to say that. Or maybe there's something you did in one service or another that you're like, I wish I would have said that in all three. Is there anything that comes to mind? Um, great question. I I don't know that there's anything clear. I, I wish I would have continued to clarify the fact. And this is what that writing of Paul is so interesting in those verses. And you can read it, Romans 1. Uh, one through verse six around there it's just in verse two the way paul says it how we get this inheritance like everything that has come to us has come from jesus mm. and i just you know a lot of times that theological thought can be so airy um that how my effort was lord how do we make it practical mm -hmm. how do we connect jesus to my daily living we understand the power of the holy spirit we see those things and i think um, part of my desire was in our conversation, we can bring more of those examples to people of this thought that Paul says that everything we got from God because he promised it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I what I love in verse two, that the fact that God made a promise so long ago and he understood that Jesus was a fulfillment of that promise. Very so interesting to me. That's very cool. Any thoughts on that, Pastor Joel? Well, one of the questions I had to flush out this because your message was titled Jesus is calling me. Right. So. One thing I was thinking as I was hearing you, the clarification of what is a job vocation and a calling. Mm. How do people kind of understand that? Because right. Paul actually, he said it. Right. He believed it. He taught it. Right. And he launched out with, I'm called to do this. 
Correct. So what does that mean in this text of Romans? And what does that mean practically to people? Because people, people pursue job career. Um, they pursue, you know, money ventures, and they think it's a calling when really it was just something that they were busy doing. Mm-hmm. Right. But it right. wasn't assignment. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. You know, I, I would just go by my experience. I think your, your our experiences too. The number one thing I would have to say it is prayer, and in the case of Apostle Paul, also comes with the prophetic. So you see all these things where to him was a very clear direction. He repeats it again, I believe, chapter twenty and chapter twenty-two, maybe, when he recalls his testimony, meaning that somebody showed up and told him, "You are called to do this." Yeah. So there was a very direct. Um, voice into what god wanted him to do but his vocation which he says was tent maker Mm -hmm. so the apostle paul didn't abandon what his job physical work was when he needed it and he leaned on that i believe when he was in ephesus um and so he leaned on it in order to you know make money and do these things advance and so i would say for people who are out there there's there's something you're called to do you might be called to be a prayer intercessor person but your daily job is a nurse and so that's important. But the guy who inspired me to go to dental school, he was, he believed, even though he was a doctor, he believed his call was to use what he had as a missionary. So he continued to do surgeries, knowing that his ability he went to college for and study, you know, almost two decades to become. But he believed, I want to put this out in the mission. So what, I, what we're trying to say, if I'm trying to define what your question is great, is for people who are out there saying, hey, should I abandon my vocation in order to pursue ministry? I don't think full-time ministry for everybody. And I, that's one of the things that I think has hindered. Well, well, as a vocation. It's right? a vocation, yeah. yeah. So people abandon everything, and this is going to be their thing. And I don't think that's for everybody. Um, it's not, not everybody's called to do this, what we do as a full-time. Uh, there is there is something very specific when it comes to the calling of God in those areas. And um, one of the things I see is... I, what I would say, Pastor Joel, is they seeing witnesses of what you've been doing. So, for example, I'm called to be an evangelist, but you haven't preached to anybody. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, come on, man, let's get real. Right. Uh, right. You know, like go out and go to the downtown San Bernardino mm-hmm. and go here and start preaching and talk right. to people. Right. Then you can define some of these things that are it happening. It doesn't in your start life. when you get a bunch of people in front of you, in other 100%, words. 100%. Right. Or an, on a church stage, either. Yeah, right. Yeah, I know historically Luther, when he came on the scene with um, understanding theology, understanding breaking out of the Catholic tradition and starting the Protestant movement, he taught this concept of the priesthood of the believer. Yeah. When the priesthood of the believer theology came out, all these people that were actually in ministry actually started their vocations. They became Mm. shop makers, woodworkers, craftsmen, because they they had this idea that I'm called into ministry and ministry is preaching. That's ministry correct. is giving liturgy. Ministry is getting up in front of people publicly addressing the word of God. Right. When Luther came on the scene, he defined it. It was ministry. It, he, he said it this way. He said, everything that God does and calls you to is a ministry. That's correct. Mm. What we say at The Rock the, the full-time minister is what we're all after. Right. Any vocation, any type of job you're doing, your application of that is a full-time minister. Yep. And, but I agree with you. Calling, Paul def- definitely did have an assignment because right. that's what Jesus told him, right? You're Correct. called to the Gentiles. Right. I'm going to make you, you're going to make my name known to all the Gentile world and opened up the opportunity. Right. And he, and he finalized. Where I see the confliction is what you were just saying. When you said in your message, it was profound to me how this doctor came in my in that missions uh, organization and defined for me something that I didn't connect a dot to. Right, mm-hmm. right. To me, that was a beautiful moment for you and right. for the those listening to that message because they haven't been those dots haven't been connected. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. And there's this confusion or elusiveness, and sometimes they wait years. Oh, or decades to find, quote unquote, their calling. Yeah. And they pursued it, uh, all kinds of ventures, the educational things. And all of a sudden they are left wanting and come into our office and the spiritual guidance and say, I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm. I don't know what I'm called to. 
Right. And, and that hasn't been defined. Yeah. You know. No, for sure. I mean, so look at it this way. If you just look at the distribution of Israel, the 12 tribe, only one tribe out of 12 was dedicated 100% to the temple. And even those, only at the family, I believe, would serve once a year. So it, it was like there were so many people, and you get a week within that to be 100% into the, the process of the temple. So even in that, the Lord was saying, you have a life to live, and you have a place to serve. And, and putting those two together is going to be really important. I just I have a hard time or a struggle, and I met many people, and I'm sure you have, of people who have abandoned their jobs or the things they do, their vocations or jobs, because supposedly you were supposed to do something, you know, full-time ministry of some sort. And then you find out what they really had was a burning desire to serve God, but they should have never left this other area of their life. Well, yes. And so putting those two together is important. I, I think, you know, and you talked about in the message the the grace or the, po uh, the mm -hmm. power yeah. and the assignment or the purpose. Uh, and so it makes me think of, you know, it is a holy pursuit. It is yeah. a righteous pursuit to follow a track and a vocation even outside of the church, right. right? For those who are understanding that they're in trade school to become electricians or getting degrees to become teachers or plumbers or own businesses, whatever it might be, I think what we've called one sacred or holy and the other as secular, a secular job versus a job in the church. Right. Yeah. Um, but I don't think Paul makes that distinction. He does not. Nowhere in the Bible do we see that distinction. Yeah. And so the call to serve God is for everyone. And then right. there's different graces that people might have. Because correct me if I'm wrong, pastors, doesn't it take a certain grace to work on a church staff? 100%. The, to, to, to work in the areas that we work in. And there are others who are graced. Uh, my wife's a teacher. It takes a grace to be able to yep. be with fifth graders for six hours a day. Correct. Right? It takes grace to be at home with our children uh, and, and, and manage those things, to be an accountant. Whatever it might be, there's a grace on each of our lives. And the call, though, is is the same for all of us. It right. just looks different. So it's not like, so I guess what we see, I'm sure we all see, someone comes in, many of you listening, watching, you've, you're finding yourself on fire for the things of God and wanting to do more. You know, that uh, we hear it like that. We want to do more. I just want to do more for Christ. I'm just this. I'm just that. And instead of approaching, well, now I better go look into how that looks like it going to Bible college, you know, right. like do those things. Great. But that doesn't have to be the next step. It, it could just be, are you, are you the light at your job? Right. Right. You, you, I was just talking to a young adult. He was like, he, he found himself now serving God and he had an open door, but guess what? He still said, I had to work my butt off. Right. And it wasn't that he was just, you know, floating around all day because he was so righteous that made him stand out. It was his hard work and work ethic and a grace that was on him that made him stand out. And then he found himself successful Yeah. for our business owners. You don't have to abandon that to pursue the holy sounding pursuit so that you can preach. That's correct. Because that's, that's correct. not, you know, you, if you're a door to door sales per person, I did this. My first job out of college was I was doing do uh, business to business sales. I was going down, down, knocking <laughs> doors. I mean, I, or I think about it, I'm like, what was I doing? <laughs> Do, uh, knocking on doors, door to door as a business person selling office products. Yeah. And I quickly found that's not what I was supposed to be yeah. doing. But nonetheless, that is a that it just wasn't my call, but it was it's a holy call. That's nonetheless, correct. interacting with people. If that is your job, bless you. I'm glad that's your yeah. your but, grace. Run with that. But what we're not saying is if you're called into ministry or a vocation of full time ministry. Pursue it. We're right. not saying not to pursue it. Correct. Right. Correct. We are saying Absolutely. that everybody has an assignment. We're all full time ministers, but define that. Yes. Let your gift write. Yeah. And make a way for mm -hmm. you. The Bible yeah. says. No, and you know the the verse verse five, which is the verse that uh, you know capture me. Paul says, "I received grace and the apostleship," and the fact that those words are separated so wonderfully, like that. Paul is saying, "I was given a grace, an ability by God." to also pursue this particular area of my life. Right. And what people do is, um, I see it all the time, where it would be, uh, you know, I'm called to sing. Um, you know, I come to, lead, to do worship, but they either don't sing well, or, you know, or they might sing well, but do not have an anointing. They don't have the grace. So this is what you were talking about. So you may have an ability, uh, you may have a gifting, but that doesn't mean you've been graced for a certain job. And this is the one thing I we have to struggle with questions. What is the grace deposited upon you in order 
to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'll clarify, I do this in my class in Bible college. I always say, I believe God call me, gave me, open the door for, for pastoring, even though it wasn't something I was pursuing, but I've always known and liked to teach. So meaning I believe God used a gifting and deposited me a grace to teach and gave me an opportunity in ministry in terms of pastoring. So you can do those things, but it might be different for some people. Mm -hmm. It might be a different ability. There's people who are very compassionate, and so they are great at funerals, helping people through difficult times. They do these things well, but me as a pastor, that's something I have to pursue in order to get better at. I don't know. Yeah. It just yeah. everything's it not does. poor on you. It yet. does. I mean— so you're saying that God graced me to be the pastor of disaster. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> I love the calling. You know, what I've noticed with especially mm. people doing what around me and, and being successful at it, um, I get a lot of nurses. Mm. I get a lot of caregivers right. that fit the bill of caring for people spiritually mm. right. as well as physically. Yeah. So it's a natural gravitation to something inside them That's that, so good. that God flushes out so yeah. good. and all of a sudden boy you're used to caregiving your vocation right but man you love those people very very well Correct. and you care for them and have this natural gifting and mercy on you to be able to do that yeah. so what i hear you saying is god's not gonna take what you would hate and call you to that right in other words like oh man you, you get what i'm saying i guess i'm leaning it's not in, a punishment I, yeah i'm leaning yeah. in because i think sometimes we're like uh, I, I would hate to do that. I get, I bet that's where God's going to call me because we feel like, you know, whereas there's that natural yeah. bend that we have, that natural inclination that God, it, it comes from God and he calls us. Now, oftentimes, I'm sure yeah. there are times people that maybe love the comforts of first world that are called to the mission field. So if but, you notice, though, in a lot of callings of, yeah, first yeah. One, I know, <laughs> Hawaii calls me. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, do you know one of the things I noticed when you read the Word of God? I wouldn't say all, but I would say the majority of people that God called all had a certain level of reluctancy mm. in the process. Yes. And what I see a lot of times in especially younger people, and I, I don't want to discourage them, is this thing like, God called me. I'm going to launch myself in, in, in faith, which you should have, and you should do that because the Bible says Abraham did it, and he's a father of faith. But there is... It's almost like a, not a prideful position, but it's almost a position like, well, you know, I'm just going for it. Yeah. And to me, I question sometimes, am I just going for it because I like it? I like the adventure process. Because people who really consider what God is asking them to mm. do, there is a thought process to this. Right. You know, there's... There's I mean, a wrestling. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul calling literally in a nice solemn... God told him, nice, go tell this guy how much he will suffer That's for exactly me. That's exactly right. So, like... That's crazy. Like, yes. I, no one's ever given me a prophecy like that. And I'm like, yes, Lord, I'm embracing the suffering. Like, <laughs> yeah. He was told that. So. Pastor Antonio has. Yeah. <laughs> he signed up for suffering. So. Here, here's a question. You say the promises of God is mm. a revelation of God, of God and the character of God. Right. Flush out what that means because we understand the character of God and how his mercy, his loving kindness, right. all these attributes of him are flushed out in the word of God. How did you tie the promises to the character? Well, Man, well, how did you flush all that? That out? is a great question. That was one of the, when I do my notes, I always write thoughts that come on the, on the side of my notes. So I'm writing all these things down. I have my points and this thought kept coming. And so I put a question mark around it and just took it to prayer. Lord, what does this mean? Like this keep every team, I, every, everything I'm reading kind of leans towards this thought. So, but I want to know what does it mean? So I, Put a question mark to it as in I'm, it's just a signal for me. I'm coming back to it. And so when I came back, the Lord was saying that when he makes a promise, he's showing a reflection of who he is to us. And because he needs to keep that promise. And that's, you know, when I share the idea and, and the thought of what happened to me when I was promising things to my kids and my wife was like, hey, you're not delivering on these things. It, there, there's a reflection on character in that. Mm -hmm. And so when people get upset with God and say, well, God didn't do X, Y, Z for me, mm -hmm. what they're saying is, oh, you are deficient in your character. And that's mm -hmm. a very like when I read that, I realized, man, it might not happen for you in the way you wanted it, but that doesn't mean that that God's character is damaged or not complete because it didn't happen to you in the way you thought it was supposed right. to. But he's still good because the Bible says he's good. He's so still they're healed, discounting so. because of time, 
or because yeah. of duration of him answering that prayer correct and indicting his character That's and correct. you're saying god will deliver right he always has delivered. Right. The Word of God teaches us that He will. Correct. Because that's how that's His character. Right. He keeps His promise. That's correct. Now think about it. So Paul says, God promised in His writings. So in verse two. So Paul is alluding from the beginning. God already told us about this Savior Jesus. Right. We're talking thousands of years. We're talking slavery for the mm. Israelites. We're talking famine. We're talking captured by the Babylonians, released by the Babylonians, captured by the Assyrian, released by the... I mean, it's a, it's a crazy cycle of life. And this whole time, the children of Israel are saying, God promised it, he will deliver. And Paul mm. comes around and says, he told us way back there in his writing, and this is it. Jesus is the Messiah, yeah. the promise he made. So that's why, to me, God's promises are attached to a revelation of his character uh, for our lives. That's now, good. I think some of the cultural things we see, uh, at least we see it coming in our office and conversations with people, is the context of patience. Mm. Right. And I want it instantly. I yeah. mean, I, I did four years of college. Where's my great job? How come right. I'm not making a lot of money? I pursued this relationship. How come I'm not married with kids yet? Right. I mean, all this instant thing. And Paul's bringing the context of thousands of years yep. before the revelation and the flushing out of what that looks really to the Gentiles. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. That was the ultimate promise because right. Jesus was prior, right? Right. The Christophanies, the historic text, the Lord Jehovah shows up. Right. Jesus was already active, but then flushes out that becoming incarnate Christ Correct. and then dying for our sins. And then Paul coming in and saying, he is the fulfiller of this plan right. that we all been waiting for. And now it's here. That's right. But this reluctancy in the human beings to wait. Right. It's just not in us to. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It is so true. I mean, um, so think about it. Abraham waited a ton. And the Bible says that his faith did not diminish because God had promised it. So Abraham understood God's character so profoundly that he said, that's what he promised. And then we already know the verse, I think it's in Romans also, where it says um, where it says that he believed he was going to raise Isaac from the ashes if he had to, right. because he promised. Once again, he's pointing to the character of God. So for all of us, you know, I always love this one verse. I, I forget which, which book is in the, in the Old Testament, where basically when they went into the promised land, the Lord said, you're going to fight for the land, but I will not remove all your enemies at once lest you become lazy in the process. Mm. So God is implying and saying every enemy you were fighting and every land you were taking, it, it was building your character, your faith, your strength, everything you're doing. And as you do that, he said, because if you abandon the land, there was no one to care for it. Mm. So my in interpretation of this today is the things that you're fighting that God promised you, they're all building one, your character. Wow. And two, if God releases all the land for you, you don't have enough in you to sustain and maintain. That's good. And it was going to be get full of wild beasts and, and weeds are going to grow. And so and, and so God said, one step at a time. So there's things you're going to grow in your life from those promises that you say, man, I didn't know I need to grow in this area. You're heading towards your promise, but you have to develop. So Romans 1, 5 says this, through him we receive grace through apostolship of obedience and faith among the nations for his name. And you landed on a um, example of George Washington Carver. Right. Which was a beautiful example and flushing out that empowering grace where he was going up rabbit trails, right, to figure right. out <laughs> his scientific mind and mindset. And the Lord had him zero on one thing, and that was what? The peanut. The peanut. <laughs> and it. flushed and out so all these beautiful things. Correct. Yeah. You know, and sometimes I think it's the grace. Yes, to call us. But this is where I believe in prayer, because prayer helps us to do yes. this. Yeah. Prayer helps us to flush yes. out the ideas that no one's seen, yeah. to connect the dots that no one's seen, to yeah. be able to work and navigate in the spiritual realm. Yeah. yeah. To get things done, because you need his empowering grace to do it, not just his brilliant mind. Right. I mean, obviously. George Washington Carver had to be a brilliant scientist. Correct. But then God said, enhanced it right. and said, watch what I do with this one thing. Right. 
you know, and I think sometimes people sell themselves short of what they've kind of confined themselves to. Right. Maybe they're getting education. I mean, I said this with my calling. I, I now in the, what I'm doing what I'm doing. My adoption had more to do with father to the fatherless mm. than I give God credit for at the early years. Right. Because all I thought was taking in broken children. Right. What God defined it is, uh, yes, but down the road, you're going to take in broken people. Oh. So good. And that flushed out this idea holistically for us to our vocation and ministry. Yep. God yep. defines it. Yep. And sometimes we sell ourselves short, Tony, with these conversations that we have with in, uh, individuals or others. And you're like, man, you're looking at it from this perspective. When God, like George Washington Carver did, God's looking at it from this perspective. Yep. And wonderful things are going to come out of it. But because it didn't fit your narrative, mm -hmm. yeah. it didn't fit your pattern, it didn't fit your, you know, whatever it was, the, your view of life. All of a sudden, you're discouraged and want to give up mm. yeah. and want to change career tracks, want to go up rabbit trails, want to fish the things. And God is saying, stay put, be patient in time. I'll deliver the promise and uh, you'll discover some beautiful things that no one else could teach you but me. Right. So good. Well, in a, a moment of transparency, I mean, you're hitting it right there because, like you said, even with George Washington Carver, it was moments of prayer. And there's been things, you know. You can go to advisors. I come to you guys, our pastors to me, uh, your counselors in my life. Um, I can go to books, which I have. You can go to podcasts. You can go to YouTube videos and tutorials on how to do X, Y, or Z. But they're only going to get you so far. Right. Uh, uh, it's, it's because the secret sauce is the time of prayer. The secret Correct. sauce is the, the, what is it called? The throne room. You know, yeah. it is that time with the Holy Spirit allowing him to speak because that's going to be the difference maker for us. Because again, you can uh, get the practical in mm -hmm. podcasts and books, all those, but it's going to only take you so far because what you'll be missing is God's breath on it. Right. And we, I, I feel like, like you're saying, I can't give you the whole land. I need to breathe on it, but I can't breathe on it unless you come and see me about it. Correct. So in our call, cause we get people, now how many times have we spoken with people and you know, like you're right there, you're on the cusp <laughs> of it. And you're here talking to me because you want me to give you right. the answers. Right. I can't give you the answers. The answer you're now looking for, you've done steps one, two, and three. You went and got the degree. You went and got the qualification. You went and got all the things that you need. The next step can only be done in the private times, in the things that you can't fast forward. Correct. And I, I just, I've found that in my own life. I can't fast forward through that last process. And it's just because God good. wants to be with us. Yep. Yep. That's excellent. Help, help people define you and your last point of your message is God's defining purpose. Mm. Help people uh, flush that out. Flush purpose out for, for individuals. That's, that's a great question. So if I would say, I would say this way. I don't think my purpose is being a pastor. I think my purpose is that's good. teaching people the things that would help them advance. Mm. That's my passion. That's good. So my passion is what can I do to help you move on to your next point, to your next thing in life, to grow in Christ, to do these things. Now, God is using me as a pastor, but my natural bend and my desire has always been, hey, what can I give you to help you go where you need to go? How can I empower you? How can I do this? How can I push it? And so I think a lot of time people tend to define purpose in what they do. But purpose is different. When I when I met you, Joel, uh, Pastor, we're, we've known each other way back, and so I understood your same thing. You had a passion for broken people, even when we talk. Now that gets flushed out through breaking free, that but that gets flushed out in many other things, in conversations, and coffee, with things like that. So you just helping someone else, like, hey, move along and heal from these things, because I've heard you say many times these things. What if what you don't heal today, you know, you'll repeat, you'll mm -hmm. do, and so. Since I've known you, since I knew before I knew Breaking Free, that was always a thought process. So to me, that's purpose. You just manifest it in a different way. Yeah. So I, that's important for people. I, to I said it to I, I was over dinner um, from some members, and I said I wouldn't be a good pastor if I'm not helping you be better. Mm. Right. It's not 
how I preach. It's Correct. not what I do. It's not my vocational skills, skill set. Because Ephesians says this, Ephesians 2.10, where we are God's masterpiece. Mm. You, this is what you use. Right. This text has created us anew in Christ so we can do good things. Here right. it is, that he planned for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. for him. Yep. Not that we self-designed. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Or, you know, kind of like manicured or vetted a, mm. a individual a visual a timeline for our life. Right. He planned. Right. So the question for the Lord is, could God, what have, are you planning for me? Mm -hmm. And what steps do I need to take to get there? Yep. yep. I, I will get the educational skill set. Right. I'll work, you know, graveyard shift. I yeah. will do whatever I need to do. But what's the ultimate goal for you to find, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's purpose to me. Yep. Right. God defining your life to be fulfilling because everything that we do as pastors, although we, we have a job and a vocation, and we do things uh, on purpose, you know, I mean, when we go to a funeral, we know how to manage these things and care for people that have lost loved ones. But at the end of the day, our purpose is is greater than all these things. That's correct. To be the officiant, right. to be the guy that marries people, to be the guy that counsels. What that ultimate purpose is, is to fulfill our image that God's created for right. us in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Right? I, I always like, um, this is a secular job, but it's very interesting because God uses these things. Um, I forgot, it's a window company, window dressing company, like blinds. And so in one of their advertising, they say, our story is that we were buying blinds and somebody oversold this and that. So our passion as a company is we will be honest, we will be give you straightforward uh, costs and everything before you can buy our blinds. And if you're not happy, so what I realized is their pain, their issue, created a purpose in them. So mm. they repurposed that pain or idea or desire into the company. But I would never say their purpose is window dressing. Right. And so that is, for me, the thing that people have to sort of define. You, m The purpose is not yeah. always what you're actually doing. It's what is driving that in your heart. For the Apostle Paul was this calling of God, but before he was there, and this is why I tell people all the time, he was already a theologian. He was already a guy who understood and That's was right. well read and was right. so for him writing, you know, 21 books, it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a shocking thing. The guy had already the content in him. And so this is important for people to, like, figure this thing out in their life. Right. So you know what it makes me think? And here's a mic drop moment, because I feel like so what I hear a little bit of for some people, they think they're in the wilderness, mm. but they're actually in the promised land. Yeah. Meaning. They're already doing, operating in a sort of their calling. It feels like a wilderness for them because it doesn't have the luxuriousness or what they've painted yet. They're operating in their gift. Right. They have favor on them and they are fulfilling a purpose that God has designed and placed them there. Right. But because it doesn't look a certain way, they're not realizing you're actually walking in your in your purpose for this time and season. That's correct. And so what would we say to those people, you know, b open your eyes to, to really fully receive those kind of things? Because you're like, have you ever talked to someone and you're not like, oh, dude, you you have I, I've been that person. My wife's been that person for me that because she's like I, I, I was w working in Bible college and I was like, well, I just I want to work with young adults because I love college age students and I just want to. And she's like, wait, you're working for the Bible college, silly. Right. You know, like, you know, so it's like, but, you know, in here, I'm just in the wilderness suffering out yeah. here when the Lord had me. You know, I would have to say that a lot has to do with what we built into. So we create what we assume God wanted. That's, That's good. how I can That's define good. it. Yeah. We create on, what we assume people. God wanted. So we're feeding this idea when that wasn't necessarily God's process That's in what us. We're out. and so for me it, i i see a lot i've been part of it I, i'll just share a story uh when i was when i lived in latin america i was a youth leader it would be kind of equivalent to a youth pastor here with the, with the day they don't call us pastor and so i went to an american church a u.s mega church to a conference and i was blown away i mean i've never been to a mega church in my life this is 1998 i think um or 1997 and so i'm looking at this church who even till this day is a huge church called mm. Willow Creek Community Church. And back in the 90s, they were one of the mega mega. Right. Like we're talking yeah. 15, 25,000 people. Right. And so I am just I'm coming from a small Latino church in the boondocks. And yeah. I'm just like, this is crazy. Like this is a church. This thing looked like a cathedral. I mean, it was just yeah. just 
the opulence, the money, the yeah. this. But what he did is instead of me saying, God, I can't do youth ministry because I don't have this. Mm. What it challenged me is, Lord, there show me what I can do with my purpose. What can I do in my context? Oh, that's good. So so in my purpose, I want to help people and help young people right. in those days. So how can I do it in my context? Right. And he let me and a group of others together to come up with something that we call organized chaos, which was just a once a month meeting for all youth in the city. Mm -hmm. And we were doing stuff that nobody was doing. I mean, we were attracting youth from everywhere in the hundreds, pulling them all in a, in a school gymnasium. Yeah. And we didn't have the games. We didn't have all the stuff. But we said, hey, what do we have? And let's figure That's out good. in our context. And it just blew people's tops. I mean, till this day, I talk to people, man, I remember you when you do this. I mean, I'm almost about to be 50 years old. These guys remember me from my 20s. Wow. And and it was just because we, did, we didn't define our purpose based on what we had. And that was one of the things that the pastor at the time of Willow Creek shared in his closing. He said, you'll come here because he realizes it's a big church. Yeah. But what I want you is God to challenge what are you supposed to do in your context. So my challenge in all we're reading and talking about Romans is, what would God have you do in your context? Don't do it my way or Pastor Tony, Pastor yeah. Joel's way. In your context, what does he challenge you to do? The purpose is the same. Come on. But the, the way to flush it out will be a little different. And I would just quickly add, I'd add this. Uh, be patient with yourself. Be patient with the Lord. Be patient with how he's fleshing things out. Yeah. Don't get too excited uh, about mapping out the rest of your life when you're just creating the things that God can use for the long term. Right. So just be patient. Right. We talk about this in, in the business groups that we have, that we don't say, if you want a God-led business, you don't go, God, here's my business, my plan. Mm. Would you bless essentially co bless my yeah. plan? It's the same way in our lives. It's not like, God, this is my plan for my life. This is what I've dreamed up. This has been my desires. Now bless it. Right. It's been like, God, here's my life. Right. I lay at the altar, lead me, guide me. You've given me purpose. You've given me design. You've given me grace, the empowerment to do it. Right. So now what? Any other closing thoughts before we finish up? No, I mean, I just love how Paul is introducing this book to yeah. everybody because he's laying a foundation yep. that not only is healthy, it's sustainable. Mm -hmm. Paul's not bringing new ideas. Right. He's bringing it to a new community, mm. the Gentiles. He's bringing it to a crazy, crazy time. Rome was crazy. Yep. And historically and biblically, that man changed the whole Roman world right. yeah. through this gospel. That's how powerful this book is. Right. His gospel th that God used to raise up this mighty man, upset the whole culture, mm. upset the whole Roman world. Uh, in, as a matter of fact, the book of Philippians says, the whole Praetorian Guard, all of Caesar's household mm. yeah. greets you. Wow. I mean, the gospel got in all to wow. Caesar's family right. and shook them up. That's, That's cool. how powerful. And he's laying a beautiful foundation. Well done, Pastor Paul. Well done. Mm, good That's job. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, we love you guys. Like I said, share this content. Post it on your social media. Help us get the word out. We pray this is a tool for you. Comment, like, subscribe. Do all those fun things. We'll talk to you soon. God bless you guys.